I'm Mark Fussell, and I work on the Service Fabric team as well. I'm Sarvan, I'm a PM on the Service Fabric team. I primarily work on the monitoring and diagnostic space. Hey guys, I'm Sudan, I'm also a program manager on the Service Fabric team. And I'm Kenzie, also a PM on the Service Fabric team. And I'm Mark Robinson. You guys can't see me, I'm remote. But welcome to our 32nd edition of the Service Fabric Ooh. Community Q&A. And this is our this is our March Madness edition. So <laughs> <laughs> we're Can looking people, like, for and stuff? some, yeah. some ra rapid fire questions from you guys. And the way um, this works is that you can ask anything that you want. Um, although I thought I would open up with a few slides of where we're looking at our roadmap, if that would be helpful for everyone. Yeah, I think that'd be great, Mark. We should do that. Um, so I'll, let me present a few things here. Um, now, as with everything, we caveat this stuff. This is basically stuff that we're working on. Um, and Wait. You, know, you want to mute that before we get the echo? There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, can you see? My I don't think we can. Uh, so are you sharing your screen yeah. in Teams? This, it's this one, yeah. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I, I'll just run through this fairly quickly, just to give you a perspective of a few things. As everything we caveat, this is that this is stuff we're working on, and we're working on it towards the next release, but it may not always make the next release because we sort of have a date where we try to put everything into, and then we do a release after that. We're planning our six five release to be starting to roll out sometime in May. It's the current plan towards middle to end of May. Um, you know, we did the six four at the end of last year. And you know, then was a bit of a break, and so this is basically the next release of that. Uh, I've just got it divided into three sections. First one is things that we're doing from a developer perspective. I think the most interesting one here is managed identities uh, coming to applications and services. That means that every application and service has an identity that's uh, inside Azure Active Directory. Um, this will be a preview, a feature. I should be very clear here, by the way, um, that comes out in this time frame. And now you can, inside your code, do localhost, get hold of the uh, identity for a service, authenticate it against Azure Active Directory, pull down other credentials. Um, lots of people have asked for this for a long time, and at the application and service level, it'll be super easy now for you to do secrets management. Uh, going along with that uh, is that we've had our ARM application and service deployment around for about a year, actually, now in preview. Uh, we use it heavily internally. Um, and we're actually going to get that to finally G8. It sits there with the preview tag at the moment, unfortunately, and we're going to GA that thing. And then finally, at the end, we actually produced a, a preview of a client, a, a HTTP client class for PowerShell and uh, Azure CLI. This means in scenarios where you don't have um, SDK installed, you can just use this PowerShell client um, that doesn't have to have any dependencies on the SDK. Which is very useful, particularly in scenarios where you can't install, um, you have limited install and, and lockdown boxes, particularly in DevOps deployment scenarios. Um, the next category is kind of things that we're basically doing around our clusters and just making it more of an enterprise platform here. You can, um, most of, one of the interesting things here is making sure we get auto certain rot rotation on our clusters um, and making sure that you can actually now push certs into. Uh, key vaults and we pull down those and also certain rotate them which will make life a lot easier we get a lot of support calls around certificate management and this will solve some of that at the same time we'll also make sure there's some checks and validations there so that if certificates are not valid or they're a wrong certificate type we do those checks when they get deployed uh, one thing in diagnostics and monitoring space is you have a control plane auditing so if you do events on your cluster like um, upgrades or um, monitoring events, you'll be able to see who did those actual events at what time under the AD credential. And then generally, cluster health reports and dealing with failures. And we've been doing a lot of time looking through a lot of support incidents and make sure our support incidents have better error messages throughout. If there are particular error messages that you find that you want us to focus on and make better, please send them to us. We want to do nothing better than make failure, error failures become better. Um, AZ availability zones are coming. Uh, we are actually testing and run this internally already across several teams, so we've been using it all. And we'll be rolling out templates for this and guidance and that you'll be able to do deploy availability zones, which is where you have multiple data centers within 
you know, the, the hero regions that have availability zones like Europe, North. Well um, equally as well, we're doing work to make sure that we communicate between VM scale sets and Azure Service Fabric better on particular channels. We have cases today, of course, where you can go into VM scale sets and do things there. And your know, service fabric layer doesn't necessarily know about some of them. So, for example, you know, we're going to prevent you from deleting what we call our seed nodes um, unnecessarily to bring down the cluster. Um, we're going to, if you, um, we're going to prevent you from scaling down your cluster if it impacts your cluster health and a bunch of things that communicate between this channel. Again, it's mostly goodness that we find when people scale in and scale out their cluster and start doing cluster level operations. Um, in the upgrade and management space, we find a lot of people ask how they want to do more granular upgrades rather than just a five UDs. And so we're doing node by node upgrades. So if you have a 20 node cluster, you can actually just upgrade single nodes at a time as if you had a 20 UD cluster that you were going to do the upgrades through. That just allows you to do uh, more granular upgrades on those things. Or alternatively, speed them up as well. Or alternatively, speed them up if you yeah. want to do that. Yes. Yeah, well, you mean do. Right. Everything at once because you don't care about safety. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. You do it that way around. Yeah, so you're not limited to five. Yeah. Um, this has been a constraint that we've had for a while because we've had it underneath Azure's UDs yep. and we're just breaking away from their UDs. Um, an interesting kind of one as well as multiple metrics on how you do resource balancing. So you can say normally you can scale up and scale down on particular you know, single individual metrics. Now we're having multiple ones inside that. And then generally much more information pushed as your advisors on best practice guidance. So for example, have you used the correct common name inside the certs? And that just provides you good feedback around those things there. And then finally, an ask we've had, although generally we think it's um, not that interesting or unimportant, but for people or some people still pushing hard for it is that's the support for low priority VMs. And low priority VMs, if you know about them, it can sort of vaporize, I think within 10 minutes or half an hour. Something that Suzanne, yes. where do you know how quickly low priority VMs like can disappear? Uh, there's they give you a 24 hour window, I think. So okay. 24 hours? Yeah, that's oh, pretty good. Oh, okay. You get the for 24 hours, but the problem arises when you get evicted. Uh, today, the notification that you have to pull every 30 seconds. Oh, that, so that's the window you're talking about. Yeah, so you can't run, yeah, so you can't run any sort of like. Stateful, yeah, super yeah. important. Any important workloads. There's no important workloads. It's all bursty yeah. stuff that can be go away and then you and never cheap. mind. Yeah. And it's cheap. cheap. Yeah. It's cheap yeah. If you if you've got cheap bursty stuff, great for that. Yeah. Um and then finally in our sort of container support, GA the volume disk for service fabric for uh service fabric replication disk, GA the Azure file volume disk. Uh we're doing just generally partnering a lot with the Windows team on what they call StarCow, which is Lin, Lin, Linux containers on Windows and Windows containers on Windows. It's a mouthful. But, yeah, but the important thing here is getting to a case where you can run Linux and Windows containers with inside your cluster. And just lots of perv reliability and density and scale inside that. If you weren't aware, we already support 1803 Windows Server Edition for this. And then finally, um, container events that come when you do things for, such as pulling an image down, deploying an image, failures with inside that. If you saw in our 6.4 release, we introduced a thing called an event store, which by the way, we're turning on by default, I believe, pretty soon. And the event store gave you all sorts of different events that happened inside the cluster, like node up, node down. Um, I deployed an application, I did an upgrade. It's a fantastic uh, source of events that you should have turned on by default. We didn't turn on six by four by default because we wanted to make sure that we didn't, you know, were aware that people could choose it themselves first, but from six by one would so be by default. Anyway, those will be coming through on containers. Um, help you and 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 generally more stuff. And so I think there's a piece of work where we're even doing working connecting to your container with SSH as well. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. We are. So that's a, which is another ask. So um so that's kind of basically our roadmap of 6.5, and hopefully I'll give you, you know, a chance to kind of see where it's going, and we will do this more regularly, things like this. And now so we, we actually already have a first question on the roadmap for Shravan. Oh. Uh, the question is, only one thing missing, sad face, Azure Monitor support. Uh, can you speak to the integration with Azure Monitor a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the diagnostic story right now with Service Fabric, we integrate with two tools that are in the umbrella within the umbrella brand of Azure Monitor. So that's uh, application insights for anything that you and your code want to to track and to log and write telemetry for. 
all of that data can end up in App Insights, and we have uh, NuGet packages for uh, .NET that allow you to do that pretty easily. And you, and in addition to that, you get Service Fabric specific information in there, um, such as which services are talking to one another and um, other contextual information like which node or which partition uh, a request came from, which is pretty neat. Um, the second part is from within Log Analytics. So that uh, what we're doing right now is we send data directly to Log Analytics, which is a little bit different from the new uh, directly to Azure Monitor that that's come out. Um, once the data is directly in Log Analytics, so this data is your metrics from your uh, from the infrastructure. So all the OS low performance counters, performance counters from your processes, whatnot. And then also the same events that Mark was describing earlier from the event store, those end up in log analytics where you can uh, write your own queries and create alerts to get notified when things go wrong. Um, that's, a, that's a story and a flow that exists today. So when people describe Azure Monitor though, um, they basically want all of their their metrics and their logs uh, going into one place as the same as their other Azure resources. And the funny thing is when a uh, service sends their logs, so in our case, if we were to send our logs to Azure Monitor logs, at, at that point, you really can't do much, uh, much useful things with them unless you tell Azure Monitor to send it to log analytics anyways. So since we're already doing that directly, that's the, the recommended path. As far as the, the metric side of things, um, we don't have like a native integration to send the, um, the performance counters directly to Azure Monitor, but all the performance counters uh, are being generated from virtual machine scale sets anyways. So if you really want, you can, and if you use only a few node types in your cluster, you can go to the virtual machine scale set resources and then click on the metrics blade there and then see all the same metrics from within Azure Monitor. And then from there also you can export those metrics to uh, to Event Hub um, and to Log Analytics too. But but just to, to reiterate though, we already send the metrics and logs directly to Log Analytics. So we uh, you don't have to do that configuration yourself from within Azure Monitor to send it there. Did I answer the question? I, yeah, I hope that gave some clarity. Well, there's a follow-up question. Which is... Unfortunately, Sorry. unfortunately, it does not answer uh, because what I'm expecting is something like Azure Monitor for containers, like in AKS, which uh, uses the hot path and uh, is extremely fast. And uh, you can even uh, see the uh, look at the uh, container logs in the real time, you get the metrics under one minute. And yeah, so that's the insights blade, right? The container insights, is that that's what you're describing? Yes, yes. It's 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 called Azure Monitor for Container and currently I container insights, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so we don't have something like that on our roadmap currently. Uh, we just have our, our log analytics story today for um, for creating that default dashboard. But as far as um, getting something like the a virtual machine scale set insights where you can actually see um, your whole, all the nodes in your cluster and all the performance counters there, that's something that um, we're gonna explore to actually just expose maybe on your cluster's uh, portal homepage. Um, one more question. Uh, do you know anything about uh, Azure monitoring agent? When is it going to support uh, let's say fast path on Windows, like it does in on Linux. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. And then there was also a question on uh, the App Insights NuGet for Service Fabric. Yes. If technically, that is still in preview, right? No, it's not. It's, it's GA, right? We removed the preview tag. All right. So Andrew, uh, specific call out. For your question, the preview tag is actually removed on that, so you're fine using that. If um, here, I just pulled this up here in case anyone hadn't seen the event um, side of things. So this is the event service. If you go into system services here, um, I got a cluster running here with the event store service here. You turn this on by going to your features section inside your service traffic extension inside ARM, and it install it uh, installs the event store service, and it means now that I can go to 
uh, particular events inside the uh, different parts of the blade inside the Explorer here. And if I can choose a time ra range here, so this particular one, I'd had a bunch of events here. So Mark, you can see you here trying, now. Are you trying to demo something because we can't see? Oh, it? your screen is on being oh, shared. Oh, OK, let me start again. Yeah, OK, let me. Thanks. All right. Thank you for okay. calling it out. I will start again. Now can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK. Yes. So here's the event store service. The event store service got installed inside my cluster here. And this is installed, as I said, by adding an extension. Um, and you'll see here, here's all the uh, cluster upgrade events. So when you just created this cluster, it did install the cluster. And then you see that it did an, an upgrade across the cluster here. Uh, you can actually go in and see the nodes. And inside here, I can see events inside here. And if I look at the same date range that I had before here, I've got some lag on this. Um, if I choose a date range inside here, you'll see that I have node up and node down events for when nodes were taken up and taken down, and you can see information about this, I think. So all of this is great to see inside the actual um, event explorer itself. They also get pushed into a log analytics, don't they, as well? Um, and then at the application level here, I can do the same. So if I go to application, um, if I go to a voting application inside here, um, if I expand this, and look at the actual events with inside the instance of it here. Um, I look at the date range inside here again, and you'll see that it'll show events about when the application was deleted and upgraded um, for this particular voting app that was deployed this one time inside here. So this helps you a lot more about understanding um, what you did inside your cluster. And then then these will also become auditing type events to say who did what, which is what the audit log will be. So you can have authentication about who did what. Uh, the one thing I forgot to add was, so the reason why we uh, we don't have the, like a container insights view for service fabric clusters today is because the team that actually built that, we had asked them to focus on building something similar for service fabric mesh. And that we're actually planning to release hopefully in the like the coming few weeks um, right now actually if you create a new mesh application um, and then you go to the the monitor and then alerts page you'll be able to see uh, metrics for it but then we're actually going to bring that straight into the uh, mesh applications portal view itself where you'll be able to click the insights blade just like how you would uh, within the AKS portal and then you would see a dashboard for your mesh like that's specific to your mesh application so if I go, that will be inside. So if I pull up a, if I pull up a mesh app. Well, yeah, you, you can't pull up, it has to be uh, like relatively new because we did okay. the prod roll out like only within a week ago. Okay, so, yeah. All right, but it will be. So you would go to where it says monitor on the bottom left. Yes. So you click monitor, no, uh, no like on the, Left yes. side, of, yeah, right there, and then you click metrics. Yes, and then here, so so here you'll be able to select your resource. Um, just like uh, I think this is what you, um, what people typically describe as like Azure Monitor. Um, here, I think people want to expect to see like a service fabric cluster, but from here you can actually just choose the virtual machine scale set or the node type, and then you'll be able to see metrics there. Similarly, you can also just choose the mesh app and you'll be able to see metrics for the mesh app. Okay, so here's a, it'll be in this, so here's a, a map app. So yeah, there. what's coming is there'll be an extra, there'll be another section like right above settings called monitoring, and then you'll have a few blades in there for alerts and insights. Okay. Awesome, any chances for this for uh, service fabric native applications? Um, yeah, not, not anytime soon. Oh, keep, keep pushing the ask though. I mean, if we hear back from you, then we'll, uh, uh I have described my scenario, uh, in the, uh, maybe, okay. Maybe I will reiterate because I want to yeah, lock down my cluster. Yes. We'll, we'll take the feedback and, um, yeah. we'll, we'll talk so, to the, uh, the Azure monitoring team. So maybe scenario. I will describe the entire scenario. So it will help to place this in a wider context. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to lock down my cluster. So there is no direct action, access to Service Fabric Explorer. The cluster is managed through ARM. 
uh, applications are deployed and removed using ARM API. So it's great news that you uh, are making GA of this ARM API because it's really awesome. And um, the problem is that I need a visibility what's going on to the, in the Service Fabric cluster, something similar to Service Fabric Explorer, but based on uh, yeah, but based on uh, Azure Monitor, Log Analytics, or something like that, basically. So uh, I need to be able to be to see what's going on in my cluster without direct access to the cluster. Yeah. So our our answer for that today would would be to use uh, Log Analytics, and you don't have to use Log Analytics either. We have plenty of customers that use uh, other monitoring solutions like Dynatrace and Datadog or new relic to monitor their service fabric uh, applications and clusters. Um, our experiences uh, and like to be quite honest, like th those customers really enjoyed those solutions more than log analytics as well. So that's also worth exploring. OK, thank you very much. I will explore those solutions, but yeah. native solution would be uh, would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, Azure and Azure, and yeah, Azure. a great world class Azure solution like within the service fabric portal would be awesome. I agree. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, OK. You keep these meetings coming and we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, OK, so we've started getting questions in the chat. Yes, I'm trying to um, <laughs> So uh, first one up is, any idea when the independent service fabric reliable collections library will be made GA? Um, That's a good question. So we, we did quite a lot of work inside that. Um, we actually have paused that a little bit because we've actually been doing quite a lot of supportability work and going back to our support cases and making sure that we ta tackle some of those. Um, it's not going to be in the 6.5 release. Um, it's because the team that actually is working on that, which is our, our state storage team, has actually been looking at support cases and getting a lot of the support issues covered first. So I think we'll be looking at that after the 6.5 release, but we will resurrect that. We will, that work has not gone entirely away. Um, it's just been put on pause for a few months. And so we'll be looking at that towards probably the six, um, the six release after 6.5, so the 6.6 release, where you'll be able to have service fabric reliable collections inside that release. That's what we're looking forward to at the moment. But no, at the moment, this, that part, piece of work has been put on pause for a while um, until later in the year. Cool. Next question for the new event store service. Is there an event store output provider for service fabric version of event flow so that the custom application events already routed through event flow that are going to Splunk and Datadog can also be piped into there as well? So that's interesting. So basically, is there a way that we can send application events to the event store uh, that shows up in SFX and stuff? That's interesting. I don't know if that's something we. Really, yeah. Yeah. Um, not today. Yeah. Um, well, well, part of it is that we don't want the event store to be your end all be all like monitoring source. It should yeah. really just be your temporary uh, sort of store. It's like your, I have access to the cluster. I know something's gone wrong. It's like a great resource to go to as your first step. Yeah. It shouldn't be like your production grade primary mm -hmm. like diagnostics platform. I think the, the, the best solution is the opposite where you also send the event store data, which is all being emitted through ETW anyways. Um, you send all the that stream of data to the same places where your application logs are going to, to spawn. Versus just crowding the uh, service fabric explorer itself. Brian, does that make sense? Yep, makes sense. Cool. cool. Question from Kai. Hey, Kai, hope things are going well. Uh, question is, yeah. when deploying containers with Compose, how can I deploy more than one container of the same type on a node? That's interesting. Right. So that's actually not a Compose limitation as much as it is a service fabric trying to tell you not to run multiple instances of the same container as part of the same service on the same node. Uh, so as you know, service fabric will limit the instances of the same service running multiple times in the same machine. So the way you could circumvent that is actually declaring a service type and then doing multiple instances of the service. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Alternatively, you could partition the service and have multiple partitions running on the same machine. But if you were to do that with Docker Compose, I guess the easiest way would be to declare each one as an individual service. Yeah, OK, that's what I did. OK, good. What were we going to do? Do you have a better session? No, 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 I was just going to say, I think the issue is that Docker Compose. 
in the in the mapping we do from Docker Compose to the SF applications, we just we just implicitly do our own service typing. Okay. And so then how the customers, I don't think we give them an opportunity to do Oh, that. I see. Yeah, yeah. Docker have a notion of a service. Correct. Type. It doesn't have all this. So. Yeah, Docker Compose is instance based. Yeah. Right. So there's no type definition inside it. So it just says this is the number of instances I want you to run. Um, and so you you have to just say, but I think the question was that, was that wanting more than one instance of the same container running on the same node? Oh, yeah, but I mean, we don't allow the more than one instance of the same. Right, so then he basically Docker Compose is not the best spot here, then it's just use the service fabric, service manifest and do multiple services of the same service type. Yeah, so we'll have, a new, or we'll have another Docker Compose. For each one. For each one that you deploy. Okay. So with, with a unique becomes, service name. But that becomes a new application. Yes. And, and a new deployment. Yes. Okay. I guess not ideal, but there's a path. Cool. Next one. Um, it would be interesting to know, are you using Docker Compose in, in, you know, are you heavily or we're just interested in how much? It would be interested to know how much you're using Docker Compose heavily or is this just for sort of test environment and things like that? Look no, no. Uh, we exclusively use Docker Compose. Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, cool. And and, uh, yeah. and and all the feature set has it been working out for you? Because we only did sort of a certain amount of the specification of Docker Compose. So uh, so far, uh, um, yes, it's it's sufficient. Um, but uh, this is a, a bit bugging me yeah, that I can only deploy five five containers on five on five nodes. Um, uh, yeah. Well, you want to deploy ten containers on yeah. five nodes? Yeah. Same container ten times. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a little tricky because we so I mean we design service fabric in a way that the the architecture for the ideal architecture when deploying to service fabric would be that instead of having multiple instances of the same stateless process running, you would actually give more resources to the stateless process. So effectively, if the design were to instead of having multiple containers that are running the same job you can split up and like multi-thread the job within the same process and then dedicate more resources on the machine to that process. Uh, obviously, that doesn't translate super well from, you know, the service fabric native .NET application type outside of that to like general containers that might run in other environments. Uh, so hence, there's this sort of weird gap sort of a thing where if you ask us, we'd be like, no, no, it's better to dedicate more resources. But can you, de can you deploy two applications and do it that way? I think that's what they're doing right now. If they're yeah, using that's what that, that's what I did, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then it'll give you two of the same type on the same machine, but in different applications. Yeah, that, that's the, working. The, there wouldn't be a way to treat them as partitions instead and do it like the named um, services, like the too. scaling that you do. So Andrew, you can do that too. It's just that uh, Kai's actually using Docker Compose, and I don't think we expose partitions uh, as a concept up there either. Yeah, gotcha. So okay. given that they want to continue using Docker Compose as the uh, sort of app descriptor of choice. The the easiest way to go about doing it is just declaring them as new applications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, next, we have any plans for resource model GA? That's an interesting question. Uh, so, Marcin, I assume you mean the the resource model that we initially shipped with Mesh uh, as like the individual networks, secrets, volumes, et cetera, et cetera, coming together. Yes, exactly. The same model that I think it's in preview, like Mika yeah. told uh, in the morning, that uh, uh, you can use the six for preview API to create a, a resource uh, model resources using the this preview API. Yes. So yes. Um, I'm going to test it today. I have not not time yet. No time yet. But. Uh, uh, and I'm asking about this resource model uh, GA for this API, yes? Yeah? So you can do this in service fabric cluster. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that at the moment, we're putting a lot of energies into mesh. Um, if you're not familiar with service fabric mesh as it stands, you know, it's a way that we have, we sort of, Microsoft stands up clusters of service fabric, and then you have a, a resource model description that you deploy your application into and host and run uh, your services there, and then that general model allows you to, you know, describe an application. And so, I would just say that you know that's getting built into the service fabric runtime. But 
at this point, we're trying to make sure we put our energies into the service of mesh because we have so many people say that that's the direction that they want to go, the serverless direction of things, where they don't want to have to be managing clusters. Um, that we're spending time there. So I think you'll see it, you know, later in the year. Um, but at the, this point in time, it's you know the resource model through the mesh services where we're putting our energies into. Um, and I can't really give you a timeline of when this GA is at this point in time. Okay, so maybe any news on the next release of Service Fabric Mesh? <laughs> next yes, video. the next release of Service Fabric Mesh. Great question. So we're probably going to ship something week after next, or maybe let's say mid-April now, so I have some room to breathe uh, without you coming back to me, Marcy. And the intent for that release will be we'll have upgrades on the monitoring side in terms of the experiences, some of the things that Shravan talked about, and then the integration with managed identities and uh, stuff from the secrets management perspective will be in there. Uh, and then along with that, we're trying to make some improvements in networking side but the resource model itself will likely not change we'll just expose a little bit more in the swagger spec and have more apis um the actual model itself we do expect to see evolve a fair amount we've gotten a good amount of feedback so as mark said there's a lot of focus on working on that but those changes will likely not show up in the next month they will show up after that oh great yeah looking forward <laughs> yeah cool yeah i mean we, we get a, we've got a lot of positive feedback about mesh um just realize that there's a lot of challenges for us because it's it's a baking a lot of service fabric into a multi-tenant environment and there's a lot of coordination with other teams we have to do that particularly with the networking team particularly with the windows container team and other other aspects of azure because making sure that we have a secure lockdown multi-tenant environment with, and even service fabric itself has lots of changes we have to do to make it a multi-tenant secure environment so that's why you know, it seems to be taking a while. It's because it is, because there's some hard problems we're having to solve and having to coordinate with other teams across Azure to get this sort of um, multi-tenant uh, containerized environment um, that you can be able to scale out and scale down containers easily with networking and, sec and, and security isolation. And um, it's taking a bit more time than because there's some complexities inside of it. Okay, next. What is happening with open sourcing? Looks like there have been no new commits in almost five months, but I'm pretty sure you haven't stopped working on service fabric. Yes, we've That's done it. We haven't stopped working on yes. service. We, we admit here actually that we actually have, um, we've done a pretty, um, in the last few months we've done a pretty poor job of actually pushing out our changes to this. We actually had quite a few complaints come to us. I think uh, we're trying to get a push out a change literally within the next few weeks as fast as we possibly can. Yes, for example, the 6.4 release hasn't been pushed out and things like this, and it really is um, not good on us that we haven't done this. So we apologize greatly on doing this. Um, we you know, had a few changes in sort of some, some of the engineers who were doing some of those rollouts, um, and we're trying to get it back on track as fast as we can in the next you know, few weeks so that we'll, we'll at least get the 6.4 out there. We just pushed out a 6.4 CU. Four for release yep. and I think that's that what you'll see inside there in the repo yeah we apologize greatly on this um and we've just been held back with getting other pieces of work in place and some changes with inside the engineering team that were doing that piece of the rollout so yes we're working on it any news or ETA on SF cluster running both Windows and Linux nodes so Andre uh, this is a question that comes up you know every now and then we this is something that we can't actually do today because there is a deep seated dependency in the transport layer of service fabric where we took a dependency on something when we built service fabric for windows that we couldn't on linux uh so having a cluster that's running nodes that are of different operating systems is probably not something we're going to solve in the near future however there is a way that you know from your perspective it, it sounds like what you want to do is be able to run workloads that take dependencies on linux and windows in the same place and that's something we can enable without necessarily having a cluster that spans multiple operating systems so uh, i don't know if you were here at the start of the call but uh, mark was presenting some aspects of the roadmap one of which is the star cow effort that's happening so star cow stands for any or all containers on windows and so we're working pretty closely with the Windows OS and Windows hypervisor and base kernel teams to basically have service fabric clusters that are hosted with Windows VMs and Windows nodes, but can run containerized workloads that have a base OS image inside that is Linux based. So you could have workloads that are both Windows based and Linux based running in containers side by side on the same service fabric cluster. 
So though you won't necessarily have like one node type that's Windows, another node type that's Linux, you're pretty much able to do everything that that would give you by containerizing and then running with uh, con this sort of stock offering that we'll have in an upcoming release. Does that sort of help with your scenario? Is that something where you absolutely need, you know, the, the nodes themselves being di different operating systems? Looking forward to a follow up in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. With that, we'll move, I guess, to the yeah. next one. And, and just so you know, that's kind of coming in. We're working on that now for the 6.5 release. Yeah, so that'll be part of 6.5, yeah. Uh, so. Any news or support on newer Linux versions? Ubuntu by Bio. Ooh. I don't know if we have an explicit timeline for... No, the only one, the only, the change here we were working on at the moment, of course, was Ubuntu, and uh, which was Ubuntu 6.1604. 1604. Yeah. yeah. And then we had, we have Red Hat in preview as well at the moment. That's a, good, that's a good point, though. Uh, what was the point? Are we pushing out updates? Are we supporting 1804 and things like this? Yeah. So Bionic is like the newest one. And then, yeah. 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 I think so we, 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 we're, 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 we're working towards supporting 1804. Yeah. Oh, we're working towards 1804? Yeah, we, we, I think we have to be because that's like the next like big longer term supported Ubuntu yeah. server yeah. Is that, distro. That's different from Bionic? Uh, I don't know if Bionic is... Bionic is 1804. Xenial is yeah, but uh, Bionic is 1804, so yeah. we are working towards Bionic. Yes. Xenial Xeris is the one we have support for today. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we are. I just didn't know the name. Yeah, the names and numbers have I see. It's weird. less relationship, but yeah, they're, they're cool names, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how does the default container repository password type work for encrypted or secret store ref? Very good specific question. Hold on, hold on. What is the question? How does the yeah. default container repository password type work for encrypted or secret store ref? Uh, this, this is, is when I wish I had Alex. Yeah. No, I know. So, so if you use um, if you use if you use encrypted, that means you've used the so Sirsar so provides in the PowerShell commandlet a command where you can encrypt credentials. Um, that you want to put in the application manifest. And then by default, the cluster, when you deploy applications with the encrypted flag as encrypted, will use the cert on the machine to decrypt that. Well, this is container repository password. Yeah, so that means you put the container repository password and then you say it's yeah. encrypted. Yes. Or you can say it's secret store ref. Okay. So those are two options. Correct. So that's what he's saying. So if it's encrypted, that means when that field that you put in, you have encrypted it with the service hardware PowerShell commandlet, which yeah. allows you to encrypt. So when you use that, yeah. I guess my question around that was uh, um, the, you just put the data uh, cipher, uh, yes. uh, what is a data cipher certificate on there? And, mm -hmm. and yeah. once you install that in the cluster, it just knows to find that um, yes. and decrypt yeah. it automatically. It just looks for that type of certificate. Yeah, so the way it works is um, you the, the certificate that you use to encrypt that credential, um, you, you have to put that on the cluster. Of course, your cluster can have 10 different certs on it. So how does service hardware know which one? Yes. That PowerShell command line that you use, um, we add some characters to that. Uh, um, gotcha. that, gotcha. that allows us to figure out in yeah. the back end which cert to use. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then uh, I saw it has another option, which is the secret store ref. I, uh, that I'm not familiar with. How does that work? Yeah, so the secret store ref is, so secret store services, I think it's in preview right now. Um, it's essentially, you can, you can reference a secret in um, the secret store service, uh, but I think that's in preview right now. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that's because, uh, yeah, yeah, you could just, I think it's just a, it's a name of, in, in the secrets, oh, secret store reference, is that, that's our local secret store. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Um, so there's a new local secret store or something within yes. service fabric? Yes. Yeah. yes, but that's in preview, and I would I would recommend using the encrypted field. Yes, right yeah, yeah. So well, there's, there's going to be three three ways for this. There's either going to be just use your certificate and embed it yourself. Service Fabric is having a built-in secret store, so we can cache local certificates and keep them securely for you, and then just reference them um, on the machine, and you can push out certificates to that. And then, of course, there's Key Vault. Um, but it doesn't. But, it, right now, it currently doesn't like natively pull anything from Key Vault. You it, you but, you essentially have to encrypt it with Key Vault, and yeah. You yeah. So there, there are some improvements coming to that integration with Key Vault as well. 
Uh, problem is, the person that would give you the authoritative answer is not here with us at the moment. I have pasted in chat his email. I would highly suggest you reach out to him. So his name is Alex, um, Alexander Johnson. Just shoot him an email. He would be, he's the right person to give you the authoritative answer on when the key vault integration stuff will be available for you to use and, and what that experience would look like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next. What is the best, easiest way to chaos test service fabric services from within service fabric cluster and outside cluster using C Sharp? So we actually have a chaos service built into service fabric. Yes, you turn on the chaos test service. So um, what I'm wondering is, is this question about chaos testing services specifically as in doing something within the business operation of the service, or is this just, is the service stable, placed, and do you have enough replicas? To test like new CPU like load testing. load testing and things like that because that's different than what we when we think of chaos testing and yeah. we think of like messing with the cluster and the infrastructure yeah. uh like are enough service instances wow. up it says what's the best way the easiest way to chaos test services with inside the service of a cluster so you, you turn on the chaos test service and then you can write uh, there's a powershell and a cli and uh, there's um, api commands that allow you to kick off a chaos test run that will be and there's basically some fixed in sort of chaos test cases that sort of kill particular processes and services from inside the applications that you pointed to that you configure it to do. Um, outside of the cluster, if you're outside of the cluster means, I guess, remotely to it, I don't know if we enable that in any way. You know, you have to have run the, you have to run the actual API against the management endpoint for service fabric. I think, I guess, I think, I can't remember off the top of my head whether the, the chaos test um, API is exposed through the management endpoint. Um, I'll have to go back and look around those things. But well, the thing is you could induce whatever kinds of faults you want via the, the, the endpoint, right? Because you could go through and simulate restarting nodes and moving replicas and a whole bunch of other stuff. Yep. Yes. Theoretically, from outside the cluster, you could do what the chaos testing service does today, which is it's just calling a bunch of very... Yes, yeah, you, you can call sort of node, node, you know, node down servers down, um, application down, commands, or, or number of application. Like just like. Sorry? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah, the question was like, what is, uh, how we can do it from outside the cluster? So I got the answer for the first question that there's uh, already an API within the cluster that can be utilized for that. Is there Correct. a way that uh, we can do it uh, without uh, deploying or utilizing that inbuilt yeah. API? Yeah, so basically what the inbuilt API does is it uses a bunch of API commands that are available from the cluster management side, right? So it induces a set of actions, including restarting nodes, restarting code packages, removing replicas or instances, restarting replicas. And in random order, it calls a bunch of service fabric management APIs. So theoretically, if you had a script that was running outside of the cluster, as long as that script could authenticate to the cluster and then use the APIs that you want to test with, you could do exactly what this control chaos service inside the service fabric cluster does from outside the cluster. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, can you name me the service or the API that's uh, available for that? Yes. So, uh, yes. So basically, the I pasted a link in the chat that basically talks about various categories of events or faults that the chaos analysis service does. So within this, there's like 60 different APIs that we like play around with. Uh, so what I would say, like I'll point you to a couple of sets of the APIs in our, um, in our in our .NET APIs and our REST APIs, and then you can sort of expand from there. Is yeah, that I'm just okay? looking at how these get exposed. Um, we we'll have to get back to you on this one. What? Why? Oh no. Yeah. Sorry, we yeah. can't hear you. Can we had a contact person with whom I can uh, talk to? Yeah, Charles Torre is the right person to reach out to. Um, yeah, put, put Charles. Yeah, I think it's C Torre. Let me just check his alias. Give me a second. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to put you in touch with the engineer who does all the chaos testing. He's a senior guy. He knows all this stuff, and we'll we'll directly ask him. Yeah. So I pasted his email as well. I pasted the link to our API reference and I pasted the article that tells you some of the groups of things that we use. 
Um, here is also the, the, the index of all the APIs that we have that you'd want to look at via REST. So I would say send an email to Charles, take a look at this index of APIs that you have options for, and then read the, the first doc that I linked to you to, to understand the philosophy behind how we set up the chaos testing service, and then you can see what's relevant for yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Cool. Jack, when will the next mesh version include actor support? Uh, no, 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 it will not. No. Uh, the next version is a relatively small release that I'm trying to squeeze through next month, and I don't think we're ready on, on the on that front. Uh, we still have a fair bit of work left to do to figure out the right way in which we're going to expose the actor stuff. So Mark has been, been yeah, thinking about I, this. Yeah, I'm actually spending time on this. I mean, just to be clear here, you know, service fabric actors today that we did, well, service fabric reliable actors are kind of fairly well integrated with service fabric itself. I mean, we actually use sort of partition uh, schemes inside there to, to, you know, in order. When you when did you create a service fabric actor ID, the actor ID gets pushed into a service fabric partition. Um, and, you know, so an actor lives in a particular service fabric partition and then it's built on top of reliable services. So it's kind of fairly, um, and then in order to discover the actors, you know, use the naming service. So when you work with inside service fabric clusters, the integration of that is fairly um, in, uh, deep. Extracting that out so that we have service fabric actors as an independent library that I can run on service fabric. Um, and in the case of mesh, it's like that. I mean, service fabric mesh, you have to realize is totally, you don't know the implementation of service fabric mesh, although we call it service fabric mesh. It's basically a container uh, application description platform where you can run any form of runtime of your choice with inside there. So I'm certainly spending a lot of time looking at how is it that we take the active framework, which is closely integrated with service fabric today and extract that so we can run it in environments like service fabric mesh, which is basically independent containers. And yet know that if you're running it inside on something like service fabric as a platform, you can take advantage of state replication and things like this. So I don't have anything to sort of say at this point in time, but it's not something it's something that's on our radar. Um, but Jack um, is asking, do you have a rough time frame for when we'd have actors in? Well, <laughs> Let's just say I'm spending a lot of my time on it right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, probably around May time, I'll have something to be able to talk about. I can imagine yeah, publicly about where the direction will actually end up. Okay. So maybe about two months time, you know, we're trying to figure out what is it that we do with actors. Because, you know, you, you know when you look at Mesh, there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, service, you know all the ins as a, a runtime. There's nothing wrong with taking Acura as a runtime and hosting those as Correct. Uh, as as other types of actor type frameworks. And in fact, we've had people who do that and have done that. Um, and so that's the approach we're trying to do. What do we do with taking actors into a product that I can run in a runtime that runs on top of mesh that's you know, independent of knowing that it's just in tightly integrated with service fabric. So I don't have anything to say right now. In a couple of months time, I will do. Uh, question for Ryan on, sorry, go on. I wanted to follow up on the actors and uh, um, what I'm trying to figure out is, uh, maybe you can hint me a bit, is whether I should start exploring Orleans with, which, which runs as a stateless service and does dynamic repartitioning and stuff like that, uh, or should I wait and uh for something from you guys <laughs> oh, well i would never wait i never i, I hate blocking people so you know if only it's something that will satisfy what you no, want no, to do no to the, let's let's say this you're trying to get a hint as to are we going to be supporting all the future pro. well i would i would hint it towards the look at what audience <laughs> has done and as we productize it um into a, a thing that would be independent of service fabric as well um, but but when run on service fabric would have all the benefits of running on service fabric like state replication inside there that's certainly what i would hint towards oh okay great thank you okay okay we got 10 minutes is this the quick fire round well we got a couple more yeah we only have about four more questions at least so far so ryan is asking will the next mesh release have reliable collection support last i saw it only had both volume support so 
It probably will just continue to have the same level from the stateful computing perspective, it's Ryan. SF mesh. It won't have. Yeah, protection. most. I mean, most of the most of the feedback and the scenarios that we've seen that are running on mesh actually uh, store state externally to the container. So a lot of these applications have containers that want to store state in volumes as opposed to within the container themselves. Uh, so we haven't really prioritized that at least right now for for getting it into the mesh platform. Instead. As you know, the service traffic volume disk is backed by the library collections. So we are bringing, you know, the same replication technology that you'd get for state and the reliability that you get in service traffic state. We're doing two, first. two stateless containers via the volumes. Yes. So you will have that level, but if you were to want to use like a reliable dictionary inside your application, uh, that's not something we are supporting, at least not in the next month or so, probably after that. Okay. Is there any chance for preview access to the Azure Availability zone support. Yeah. I mean, Theoretically, there's a template that already exists, isn't there? Well, there is. I mean, we've been testing it internally. Um, you know, I guess his ask is, you know, can I be a, a preview customer? Yeah. Well, that's, I, I guess. I mean, we can we can put you in touch with the right people and then you can have that conversation. Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you want to be a preview customer. I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Oh, send us your email. Well, we may not want to post it in the window, send it to me. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, sure, send me an email. I'm pasting my email in the chat. Okay. Any progress on BYO VNet for SF Mesh? Yes, plenty of progress on BYO VNet for SF Mesh. Uh, still, though, we're waiting on uh, some dependencies from the Azure networking team, which has been a little bit harder to get and will take a little bit more time before we can say that it's something you can actually use. Uh, it is our, one of our top priorities right now. It is something we're actively working towards. We're trying to make sure other people are prioritizing as well, and we hopefully will have something in the next couple of months to share on that front. Do you have any experience with running .NET core services on framework dependent de de Framework dependent deployments, which FDD model. If so, is there any good way to maintain .NET Core up to date on the nodes? Oh, okay. I think mm. uh, framework. This came up. Can you use POA for this? Framework dependent. Deployment. Well, you're updating the .NET Core packages. Yeah, with patch orchestration agent, you can specify which packages on the nodes you want Need to, to be updated. updated. Yeah, and you can specify like the gold state, so you can say like this is what I want. I don't ever want it to go over this version. No, but the thing is. I think this is where you know. I think this question and speak of this is where you want, you know, you want um, just to, your binaries for your app inside the deployment, but the actual machines have the version of the .NET deployed inside them all. Yes, it's just like how do I make sure I've got version you know, 2.2 of .NET Core deployed across all machines inside my cluster? Okay, I think that's the question. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm looking for, and and the reason why I want the FDDs is I'm working in a medical company, so whenever I recompile my service, I need to recertify it, which is a major pain. So I yes. don't want to need to recompile them every time I need to patch okay. or something like right. that. I know Matt was Matt Schneider was looking into this, um, and I don't have an answer for this at the moment. Um, you know, we've been telling, there's been all sorts of sort of weird hoops that people have to jump through today where you have to deploy your own extension that pulls down a, you know, a package and deploys it across the machines inside the cluster. Um, so generally, we've been having people do that approach, which is pretty poor. Um, I know that uh, there's talk about how you can have an, an image service where you can actually push out your own images of things, but I, I don't know the answer to this right now. I know Matt. Good. I think we should put you in touch with Matt Snyder. Yes, I, and it's a very important question because we're having a lot of your scenario is very, very key. Yes, you don't want to have to deploy all of the .NET Core 2.3 runtime within your application because you just said recertification, but instead you want it to be up to date on all of under the machines. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer for this night now, but I know Matt Snyder has been looking into this. So let us try to get back to you, and we'll try and get an update of this. Hey, so I posted uh, Matt's email as well. He's also probably gonna, he, he's probably gonna have, as Matt, Mark said, the best source of uh, at least options. I know he was talking. You he do. was talking to the the, the compute. There are a bunch of internal teams that have this exact problem. 
Because yes. a bunch of our Microsoft teams use FDD stuff. I've seen plenty of threads go by on this. So yes. uh, there's certainly so some ways that they're all doing, so he probably can tell you what your best options are. at the moment. Uh, I don't know the answer to this. Before. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Slavomir, uh, can you say, you, do you see the emails? Are you good? Can you reach out to those folks? Yeah, yeah. cool, thanks. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, uh, great question, by the way, and very, very topical. Yeah, okay, last four minutes, uh, a couple more questions. Did anything come from last month's query about building .NET Core actor services for Linux on Windows? Update the MS build provider, question mark. Ooh, this is something that uh, Dave was talking to Matt about, I think, uh, which was there was some weird case in which you couldn't actually build Linux. You can build actor services to run on the next clusters from a Windows machine. Oh yes. Yeah. I don't I don't know if that's been sorted yet. I know it's on the backlog somewhere, but I don't know if it's been been dealt with. I don't know. Yeah, I don't actually know. Uh Dave, can you shoot me an email or shoot Matt an email and, and we can follow up with you? Yeah, sure, no problem. Cool. What is the status of the new resource model in a pre existing non mesh Azure based clusters? Love to have starting things like secret resources. So we actually uh shipped preview support for the resource based application model for service fabric clusters in 6.4. So Jacob, in theory, you should be able to use at least some subset of the resource based app model on a service fabric cluster today. Uh, but I mean, you can do it. We support it on the local cluster, so we always supported this. It's just that we don't didn't expose it via like we didn't make it easy to do it because um, we didn't have CLI commands that would do it for you. Yeah. Um, but it's in preview. So. It's still in preview, but yeah. it is there, sort of. Yeah. Uh, well, if, I mean, I'll go back to what we said before. Like mesh, we're trying to land next versions of mesh. Get this done to yeah. solidify the model. Yeah. That's the priority first, and then it will come to. Then it'll come to service. Right. Right. Yeah. So we don't really have anything to say on the non-mesh service fabric clusters yet, other than we're trying to land it in the mesh one first. Yeah. And then because it's built in service fabric, you can get it there. Yeah. Um, six four. I don't. Sorry, six five is not gonna. Is good to have the same things that you have as preview that you have inside mesh. Right. So Jacob, I hope that makes sense. Basically, you know, sort of stay tuned for what we do on the mesh side. Once we feel like we're ready there, it'll sort of come to service right relatively quickly after that. Okay. Is there some way that we can set a depends on constraint on standard service fabric services? We have a third party reverse proxy running on our nodes and would like to hit the proxy at localhost. Uh, can you do depends on across service fabric services? Is that like a is that like an order of deployment question, or is that like you need to have the reverse proxy service running? Oh no, I think this is uh, inside my application. Yes, he has I, a follow up uh, post there. Uh, follow up. Uh, oh yeah, reverse proxy often gets moved or deactivated before the services that depend on it do, causing requests to look. At, oh, yeah, so this is actually something that Matt has been aware of and is working on and getting built out because this specific scenario has been asked about a couple of times, uh, which is service A depends on service B, then for some reason there's a replica move and service A moved before service B moved and then service A crashed. Um, so there, I don't know the latest on where they are with it. I do know that this is something they've been working on. Uh, Jacob, I would recommend reaching out to Matt Snyder as well. Um, Matt's going to have a lot of fun when he sees all these. He's actually presenting in about 20 minutes at Games Developer Conference in San Francisco. So now is a great time to bombard his inbox. Yeah, if, uh, if you are if you are down in the GDC, Matt, Matt's doing a Wizards of the Coast. If you, yeah. if you didn't know, but Magic the Gathering game runs on Service Fabric. From the Magic the Gathering Arena specifically, because okay. there's like three different online versions of Magic okay. the Gathering. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Jacob, I would recommend uh, sending an email to Matt as well. Matt for president, indeed. Uh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, with that, we're on the money. You got, you got one last one. You can probably get through as far about documentation from Jacob as well. Can you, can you please document what's actually available? Oh, so that that's kind of I think I think what he means is with relation to when we get the mesh resources in there, yeah. the support for the mesh resource model or the resource based app model into service fabric. So that will come after we are confident about that app model, which is currently going through significant changes which after which we have settled on those changes and brought it to the mesh world, we will then bring to service fabric. Yeah. And when we do, there will be documentation. Yes. <laughs> Mouthful, <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to wrap up. Well, yes, thank you I for joining us it. again. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we rest of the questions. As always, push questions to service fabric issues as well. Yeah, the GitHub repo. GitHub repo, that's another place to ask these things.
And see you next month. And see you next yeah. month. You see you Thanks, everyone. Thank see you, you next month. Thank you, Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Check.